our four part series. Um, we are super excited to have you with us. And um, today we're gonna be talking with Jack Morris and Jeremy Petty and um, giving you guys some more information about digital marketing and, and really positioning your company to acquire more clients and customers and uh, really fine tuning your marketing skills. So I wanna introduce Jack. Um, Jack has been with the uh, Minnesota score for quite a long time and he came to us with a very long career in marketing. So you have a leading expert in this field with you this morning, over 35 years in branding, um, in brand management. And he also served with Chick-fil-A, Georgia Pacific. He was marketing in the hospitality industry. Um, but he has a, a wide breadth and depth of experience. He has his MBA in marketing management from NYU and has completed his doctoral courses in communication. So he has a really great background to help you in fine tuning your marketing for your business. So we're really happy to have you with us, Jack, again. And Jeremy, uh, more recent to SCORE, but uh, certainly has a great depth of experience in the digital marketing field. Uh, over 10 years of experience. He is born and raised here in Florida. He has a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, from the Art Institute. And his experience is in web design, SEO optimization, um, search engine marketing, paid advertising campaigns, email marketing, social media marketing. And he's run companies um, that focus on that. He's helped hundreds of businesses in fine tuning their digital marketing strategy. So we're super excited to have both of these professionals with us today. And um, if you don't know anything about SCORE, uh, a little bit about that uh, from our standpoint, you know, we are a national organization, part of the SBA. Um, we've been around for a really long time and um, we are super excited to have you here. We offer mentoring services. So if you do need help one-on-one -on -one to help your business, you know, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you with that. Whether you're in the startup phase, whether you're looking to grow your company or scale your company, whether you're looking to exit your business, we're here to help you. Um, and we have a wide variety of volunteers. These are all retired executives or people who are top in their field that can truly help you in you know, expanding your business, growing your business, or even planning your exit strategy. So we're super happy to be here. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jack and also just recognize our community partners as well and thank them because without them, we would not be able to be here. We would not be able to have the expertise of someone like Jack or Jeremy to bring you this information today. So Jack, over to you. Okay, Paula, thank you very much. Hey, everybody, welcome. This is session three of a four session uh, series of tutorials or live streams. We're gonna be dealing today with the idea of identifying valuable customers for your business, whether it's conceptual or whether it's existing. Um, just as a quick review, um, it's been weeks. So as a quick review, we're gonna go now on the other side of the communication model. Jeremy and I have spent the last two weeks giving you ideas on how to create a message and how to apply it to the internet, SEO. So that's the sender side of communication. We're now moving over to the receiver side. And now we're gonna do the same thing except applied to finding those customers, the receivers of your message who are gonna to come to you, become paying customers. And so um, what we're trying to do, Jeremy and I, is in four weeks, giving you overviews on how to develop your program to do your best job of developing your marketing communications. At the bottom is a nifty little clear and concise statement about this process Jeremy and I are working on. Both of us are dedicated to helping you understand how you can develop an efficient and effective marketing communication program involving a well-crafted message and it is sent to a properly profiled audience. That's a clear and concise way. Um, I uh, looked at that this morning. I, can, I didn't change it, which must mean something good about it. Uh, 
hey, listen, you know, you might want to convert this little thing to a post-it note and put it on top of your computer. Because every time you start working on your business and looking at the computer, this little thing at the bottom is going to be a way to give you the direction and strategy on, on which you need to put your energy into. Okay, uh, we are going to, again, to repeat what Paula has already said, whether you're a conceptual or an existing business, we've spent time talking about your business status and message creation by developing strength words from a SWOT analysis, figuring out how you can get unique selling proposition expressions to come out of them, to evolve from them. And then Jeremy helped you better understand how to take that information, that list, and start figuring out how to convert it into an effective search engine optimization program. I need to say this, and I'm going to say this a couple of times during my presentation. Regardless of the status of the business you are trying to work on, conceptual or existing, right now, you are the boss of, of customer profiling. In other words, those judgments that you already have inside your head are going to be your platform from which you're going to proceed. So let's just all agree that your personal judgment based on whatever time and effort you, you spend is going to be the best information available. Own that, live with it, because they're going to be very much enhanced when we give you the programs on which from which to build on them by developing investigation and research information, which is gonna validate, expand, make them better. So, okay, Jeremy. So what we're gonna to do today, we're gonna go through three basic areas and put a, put a focus on two of them, but how do we develop a customer, a potential profile for our customer? And may I inject that in marketing, profiling is a positive. So uh, not only is it a positive, it may be at the end of this session, something you also will agree is an essential and mandatory for you to do. If you're going to follow that little post-it note and make sure that your communications are both effective and efficient. We start with the one that's had the longest uh, uh, lifespan. Demographics is a way of describing people as you can see, it's a way of describing people in a way it tells you who they are. Um, if this begins to look like a series of things that sound familiar to you, uh, be aware of the fact that our beloved government uses them every 20 years, 10 years, 20 years. The government census is all based on your government acquiring demographic information about its citizens. So. These criteria for demographics, age, race, ethnicity, gender, marital status, income, education, employment, are the who's of your customer profile. Very important. Uh, I might suggest that this is where you would begin your own company's you know, customer profiling. You begin with the, with the system that is the most uh, mature, the most well-established, the ones where you can find outside help to help you craft that that demographic uh, profiling. I'm gonna move from there later on in this presentation uh, and to develop something that's a little more complex, not difficult, but complex in that we're gonna go after things known as psychographic profiles. We're, again, remember, these are people who constitute prospective customers of your business. So what is it about them? What is it about your customers' attitudes what is it about their aspirations? I know I could have used a, a word, wishes, but then that begins to sound like a Disney movie and I opted to use the more uh, accurate word, aspirations. What do your customers wish they could have uh, with, the, with the category of products and services that you yourself are beginning to explore? So aspirations uh, are the things that they have not had satisfied yet. And what, are, what kind of behavior is out there? And we'll get to explaining why, but why their behavior can be monitored, identified, and incorporated into an effective customer profile. Now, what's that thing at the bottom? The thing that has a cute spelling of a word, you know. Uh, spoiler alert on this, I did not bring this uh, to SCORE. I would love to uh, take credit for it. I literally got this after I joined SCORE. Hey. Everybody can learn something sometime, you know. So I uh, I heard about this from a presentation. 
gave it my skeptical, what's going on here, and began to realize, doggone it, this is actually a very interesting way to add another dimension to your understanding your customer profile. Who are your customers? Well, they could be effectively, listen to this, this could be effective for you if you started conceptually thinking about who's buying the product or service, the purchaser, the P, who is a major significant influential toward that purchase. They may not be there with the purchaser, but they basically said everything they needed to say prior to that purchaser making the decision. And that purchaser was influenced, there's the word, influenced enough to maybe buy what the influ influentials wanted. And then the last thing is, is it's altogether possible that the person who's actually going to consume the product or the service is a third and different party. So this target uh, marketing profiling is as easy as pie. Uh, never mind. Is as easy as pie. Um, is actually bears some truth to that. I mean, this is interesting. So when I finally accepted it, adopted it and embraced it and put it into my presentations, it's like, who would best, what's a good example of how that's applied? And, and it, for better or for worse, I thought the Disney operation was really a good candidate to explain purchasers, influentials and end users. And very quickly, my understanding, I didn't, I never been, uh, an employee of the Disney, but I, I've always admired them from afar because they do whatever they do, they do it real, real well. Who purchases the products and services? And I would offer to you, again, this could be a family. Demographic might be a family. The purchaser is going to probably be mom uh, in the family. You know, she's going to actually commit to buying the tickets. And um, so, Mom's the purchaser. Let's just move on and say, okay, who's influencing mom? This one becomes rather easy for those of you who are parents of children that might be between the ages of, uh, I don't know, when did they become influentials? Probably right day one, but let's just say they become effective influentials around four to seven, where they see some commercials about how much fun life will be when they visit the Disney properties and they start talking to mom. So mom starts hearing from the influentials in her, in her organization. And so the kids become influential. That's really important because if they're that important, don't you think they should have their own communication? The answer is yes. Disney emphatically targets young kids as, as a group that they wanna make aware of and interested in their product. The last one is end user. This is where it gets a little, um, interesting creatively because who else is involved in, in, in the family uh, decision and, and to go spend a vacation or time at Disney? It's dad, good old dad. Um, he may not vocally be all rah-rah about coming, but he's coming along and he's gonna be wondering, is there something here that I could use to spend my time while I'm there? Yeah, I wanna be around everybody and that's all great. But that ride that takes me upside down and spins me around, I need to find something else to do with my time before I go and expose that. So dad might wanna be interested in knowing what else they got down in those Disney on property Disney resorts. There's golf, there's all kinds of other activities where dad can kind of say, hey, I'm taking X day off and I'm gonna go play a little golf and dad becomes a happy camper. And now you understand why pie becomes interesting. You're not gonna find those definitions necessary. You certainly won't find it in the demographic. You may not even find it in, in a psychographic, but if you use that kind of extra dimensional thinking in the way you're constructing your overall profile of your customers, I think pie becomes very helpful. So check it out. All right, where are we going from here? Uh, we're going down to the demographic analysis. We're gonna begin with it. So again, we're relying on you. You are the source of your best information available. Construct what I would call a primary demographic profile. Primary demographics would probably be who are you super confident is most going, is going to most be a customer? Who stands the, the best chance of becoming a customer? Um, the easiest sell? Who will become the least resistant to your communication? They're already kind of using things along those lines. So your primary demographic profile are the customers who are going to quickly come over to you if you say the right things to you. 
They're already involved in your category. Uh, they're using your competition. They're, they're prime, they're prime for your message. So that's the kind of person I want you to think mostly about. Quickly, could there, would there, should be an effort on your part to develop a secondary demographic profile. Uh, people that won't be as easy to grab and, and might be uh, a little bit more elusive or hesitant to accept your, um, your communication message. And all I'm saying to you at this point is, yeah, that probably exists. A secondary demographic profile is probably of some use, not now. Put that on a to-do list. Maybe that's a, a thing to do later on in 2021, but don't ignore the idea that it probably exists. And this is how you'll expand your company because you'll be tapping into the secondary mark of profiles that you've already uh, developed with your own good judgment. So bottom line, we're gonna summarize the demographic analysis is helps you to determine, remember that list of things we talked about? It's gonna help you determine when and where those customers are. I will explain that momentarily. So you develop them. Now you're gonna go find them. You've got, your, remember you used your judgment, you know what the definition of demographics are. You've got all those, those criteria. So now you've kind of filled in the blanks and you've developed some kind of a best judgment profile. And by the way, it's probably real good because who would better be able to start the development than you, the person that knows absolutely the most about the business you're trying to either start or expand. So you're gonna to try to figure out, okay, Jack says, I can find these demographics somewhere. Where do I go look? Well, real quick, I'm gonna direct you to two places. Uh, I'm gonna direct you to your local library. And obviously I'm going to refer you to the internet because isn't everything going to eventually become available on the internet? Now, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna take you first on a sidebar. Before we go visit the options of the library or the internet, let me give you Jack's sample demographic profile. What might it look like? Um, again, the spoiler alert is for me to tell you, I made this up. This doesn't relate to anything that relates to a business that I'm personally involved in or that I'm held. I made this up just to give you an example. This is how you, how you start working your primary demographic profile. What kind of people are we talking about? Well, if you've got one in your judgment, you think your product is very, very attractive, should be very attractive to Hispanic women. I made that up, okay? So you've got Hispanic women in your gender and, and nationality, uh, somewhere between 25 and 50 years old might be another way of explaining that they are employed. Uh, some college, um, you know something I really can't go into, I don't know what you're, trying to do but education might if it's important might help you understand how to effectively go after people who satisfy that educational uh definition no college some college college degree and beyond so that's what that's in there uh the household that this hispanic uh woman is involved in what's the income that uh we can track uh, there are ways to get that information uh, the there's demographic information on household income readily available. If their income is important to you because you want a certain profile that has enough money to spend on things that aren't what I might call essentials or necessities, food, clothing, shelter, basics kind of things. If they need money, vacations are a ex great example that maybe if you move that move that household income up a little bit, you can assume, good judgment, you can assume that they've got some money to spend on some things like that. And, and so household income becomes a variable for you to consider. And then I slapped in a geographic, uh, Western metro cities, uh, for reasons only I knew when I created this slide. But I wanted you to understand that maybe, maybe, there's a demographic that, mat that allows you to geographically profile your customers. Any of you out there who are looking at a retail operation where you are going to occupy a fixed office space, this one at the bottom is critically important to identifying where you're gonna go get those people to visit your business. Visit, drive up to, walk up to, public transport. They're gonna come to you where you are located. So geographic, Demographics are critically important if the situation 
warrants it. That's why my demographic spoiler alert is at the bottom. These are not equally important. They're not. But they, the more you can put in and feel comfortable about them, the more you're going to be able to kind of work through them and prioritize, which you have every right to want to do. Anytime you can focus more on some things than all things, then you're going to do a better job achieving the, the goal you're after. I, you know, I don't have a personal, you know, things like, well, there's obviously it's this and that. But, you know, something age has always struck me as one that always seems to be coming up as a, as a critical, as a critical thing, uh, and, and income money. And I think those two things, I would feel comfortable saying to you, those, uh, those warrant your attention. If you're, if you can get good information in those two and you can add the others to it, more power to you. But I would strongly suggest that you go after the age and, and uh, income demos. Okay. So now we're back to library internet. Here's a here's a little something to share with you. Um, nine o'clock this morning. Um, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say that right now. Nine o'clock this morning. I looked at this slide and, and I'm like, I don't think this slides. I really need to work on this slide. And I did. So be, buckle down on this one. I'm going to be here for a bit. I want to talk to you about this. Here's what here's the 9 a.m. morning discussion I had with myself regarding this slide. For years, I have talked about in front of seminars and doing other presentations to this issue, I became very uh, comfortable with the idea of recommending that you go to your local library. It was a very sound recommendation. Go to your local library, go to the resource center, find the person that works behind that resource center and get them to give you some business related demographic sources. Um, and I'm gonna say emergent intellect. You don't have to write that down because I'm gonna give you a way to find it. Anyway, it's nine o'clock this morning and I'm looking at the library and I get this little kind of voice in my head going, you know, this COVID thing is getting is getting squirrely and it's gonna probably get squirrely all over again. And there was a time in the recent past when the local library was not open. And I sort of said, I wonder if there's a way to get to get around that right now. And so I used my time this morning to go find uh, some things and I'm gonna share this with you. Uh, yes, I'm going to verbally share this with you. I'm sorry, I did not change the slide, but I literally found a link to how to find business information that's available in your library and find it on the internet. So I'm going to spell out the link, and I apologize for that, but it's legit. So if you'll take your writing utensil and on a piece of paper, put down this link, B-I-Z, biz, B I Z L I B library biz lib guides, as in a lot of guides, G U I D E S dot S M U Southern Methodist University dot E D U biz lib guides at S M U dot E D U. Um, by the way, um, you'll be able to contact me. And if that didn't get clearly through to you, um, we'll figure out some way to, for you to confirm that. And, and I will do that with you as I'll do the best I can. But if you were diligent and wrote that down, you're gonna get a website on the internet that's gonna help you prepare your library visit. And as a matter of fact, this, um, this merchant intellect is a link on that site. So you can go right to Merge and Intellect to get the information that you'd have normally gone to the Library Resource Center for, and the internet's gonna, gonna make it easier for you to do. Uh, again, that was a 9 a.m. Uh, epiphany. Uh, and I thought it was important enough to share with you that if your local library in the next couple of weeks or whatever doesn't become a viable option for you, you can go to the internet, you know, and, and, and find your way around that. There is another internet option that I knew about a long time ago, and, and this, was, this one's kind of fancy and clever. 
this is an internet link that will allow you to do your demographic profiling on the internet. They're gonna give you a program and you're, and you're gonna be able to use that link to develop your demographic profile. And, um, and basically it does that because you will identify who your main competition is. See the spoiler alert at the bottom? If you can name a competitor that's either local or national or regional, plugging it into this uh, software is going to allow them to analyze the demographic of that competitor. And you can then borrow, that's a legitimate marketing term, by the way, you can borrow that information and use it as your foundational support for your demographic analysis. So there's two links I've given you, one convenient here right in front of you and the other one I verbally gave to you that can help you get through your, your um, research when you start researching your own company's demographic profile. I hope that became clear to everybody. Okay, Jeremy. So again, to repeat, so you're starting to develop that demographic profile and you're beginning to identify where are your customers? You know, it will tell you that. It will tell you where they are located. Um, where's Waldo? And, and it's, it's your where's Waldo game, except it's not a game, it's your business. So demographics, where's Waldo? Psychographics are gonna start telling you about how your customers or prospective customers think, why they do what they do that involves your business. So the why of your customer profile becomes an increasingly, very increasingly important part of it, because as I explained to you in the bottom of this slide, because it's gonna help you understand your prospective and existing customers' attitudes about you and behaviors regarding you. Critically important part of, of your business profile. Jeremy, you would be so kind. So your demographic, you've got a demographic profile. And by the way, we're once again, it's what you believe it is versus what you know. I mean, it's, do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to believe that your best information available is good enough to start. We'll get to what you know about this for certain with stats and facts and, and, and support information later on in my presentation. So you start with your good judgment, develop your, your demographic base profile, and then get into talking about what are the problems and needs that my customers, remember we're now, Jeremy had said earlier um, in, in his presentation last week, you got to think like your customer. And boy, I, I wrote that down because uh, I've said that other ways, but I like the way he said it. So if you're thinking like your customers, you've got to creatively figure out what are the problems and needs they have that I'm going to come around and solve with my existing or conceptual business. And lastly, in bold, what is their usage situation? Where is their actual, where is their consumption behavior? And how can I get them at that point when they're either doing it or about to do it? That's an important thing to understand. Problems and needs, and then the usage behavior that helps you better understand how to intercept them. You're gonna intercept them at a time when they're thinking about the category that your business is in. Okay, moving right along. So last week I gave you a preview and told you that I was going to uh, give you a couple of examples on how to kind of construct a grid, a two-dimensional grid of a three-dimensional customer profile. So the two examples, uh, one was, I invented myself a better mosquito repellent. And uh, I think I defined it in my preview is better is defined as longer lasting. It's what people wanted and needed. They needed to be able to have a mosquito repellent that they wouldn't have to you know, frequently reapply while they were busy having fun. So there was the need and the want that I was that I was addressing. I was also going to figure out where do I find people when they're using or about to use or thinking about using 
mosquito repellent. That's the usage situation for that product. Got it? The next one is really important, and I'm going to linger on the slide that's following this because this one is a, uh, is a business situation that both Jeremy and I are going to use as the benchmark from which you're going to understand how we work it through. And you can use that as your example, your model for how to work your business or your service uh, or product that you're developing. So I, and I then, in order to do this, I decided to think about a better lawn care service. What on earth? Okay, I got to go back into the marketing library. I walk around with inside my head. I'm like, what does that mean? So I think, I, you know, just for the sake of a conversation, I think I'm going to, for this time in, in, in life, I'm going to develop better as maybe includes landscaping. Maybe it's lawn care and landscaping from one source. Minutes go by and now I'm into this better thing. And I figured, what if technology were added? What if my lawn care service utilized state-of-the-art technology? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna own that. So I had to do that to kind of develop who you are. I had to pretend I was you watching this presentation. I, I got a product I'm trying to work on. I got a service I'm trying to work on. So I had to try to figure out how do I invent something that you can relate to that satisfies these criteria for psychographic profiling. And I was like, what are my customer or prospective customers wants, needs, and what is that usage situation? Uh, that's okay, Jeremy, keep it. Um, okay, never the best. Uh, so when I mentioned Jeremy on better lawn care service, this one is going to be one you might want to make a little note. This is week four. I mean, this is kind of a homework exercise if you want to get a little on top of that. So go ahead, Jeremy, give me that next slide. So <clears throat> we're constructing customer profiles. Remember the little post-it note. We're trying to develop a communication going just to those people that we believe in our judgment are going to be customers, but importantly, we're they are likely to become repeat customers. Isn't and that just a, a wonderful thought? You want to communicate to people who will buy from you and come back again. So we're obviously looking at customers that like you enough, need you enough, and are using that category of products enough so that they will come back and develop some usage frequency. Loyal customers is a perfect example of that. They don't think about the competition any longer. Their quick reaction is to come to you. So we're also going to need down the road to be able to figure out how we're going to get some effective feedback from both of our customers and the media that we're using to communicate with them. And this feedback word is a research model word that helps us better understand, are we making sense? Remember that post-it note? And you're gonna, you're gonna use research and feedback to be able to determine, am I on the right track to developing effective and efficient marketing communications? Now, I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation. So let's get to this next chart. Okay, please make make sure you know what you're doing. If you think you're satisfied with your with your profiling and you're like, okay, I'm ready. Well, go ahead and be ready. But remember, don't be too ready because you're going to need that feedback to help you do something that Jeremy uh, made sure he that you understood when he was talking about SEO. It doesn't stay the same. It's it's dynamic. It keeps changing. You got to have a research program that continuously gets feedback from your customers and from the media. We're going to be dealing with two forms of research. Jeremy, I'm on slide 19 and I really, can you go back a little bit or I'm going here? Can you go back and let me make sure? Go back again. Go back one more time. Okay, let's move forward. I had a panic attack here that I thought I was actually going through no, we've missed something here, Jeremy. Um, I've got a grid here. Could you? There should be a grid dealing with mosquito repellent and lawn care. Um, 
can you find that for me, please? Or I'm going to have to talk my way through it. Or people are just going to have to go to the slide uh, when they come back to this presentation. This is kind of, can you find this, Jeremy, on the I'll list of slides? It's kind of where the rubber hits the road. And I don't mean, if we don't get this, you'll be fine because you'll be able to see it when you come back and get it when you revisit the presentation. On the revised presentation, it was slide 11 for whatever that's worth. Bingo, thank you, sir. Christmas just came. Okay, gang, buckle up here because I'm, I'm getting close to getting into the balance of the, of the session. Wants, needs, usage on the left side, done. I put a little, little jack note here. Wants are important. Think of yourself. What's more important, needs or wants? Needs, I gotta have it. Wants, wouldn't it be nice? So there's a priority between needs and wants. What's your company doing about that? You know, are you prioritizing your solutions? So mosquito repellent, the customer wants sunscreen. I believe that that would be an enhancement to a product, but I'll tell you what they really want. They need it to last longer. Think of mom trying to keep her busy kids, you know, repelling those bugs while they're running around at Disney. You know, they want it to last longer. So last longer is a priority. I got it in bold, but by the way, come year two on this product, on this imaginary product, I might want to check out what can chemically, what can I chemically add that's, that's efficient and safe? Can I add a sunscreen to this for those lesser important benefits, but boy, if I could put sunscreen into my mosquito repellent, I've got, a, I've got an even further improved and competitively enhanced product. Where are people gonna be looking for mosquito repellent? These are people who enjoy outdoor activities. There are individuals and there are groups, people that join groups that do stuff that is a fishing club or something, you know, Stan? People that are out there, activities, both as solos, as a group, Fam people who take family vacations, people who family travel. These are all the behaviors and, 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 the, and the attitudes. People in this group are looking at a new improved a mosquito repellent. They know they want that. Let's move over to the one Jeremy's gonna inherit from me. What's a new and improved, you know, lawn care product? Uh, I got under their wants. Wouldn't it be great if I didn't have two companies coming to, to my home or, or what, what I want to have work done on? What if I had landscaping as an additional service? Landscaping means the addition and, and deletion of plants and, and trees and shrubs. And, you know, how does the place look? Are, are we got an assortment of things and then are they going to be properly maintained? So landscaping to me, and, I, and by the way, I happen to know companies that do both, you know, that would be something the, the target audience would want. It'd be a nice convenience as long as they both work. I also want to make sure that the people that are working for me in my lawn care business are environmentally concerned. They're not going to use anything that's going to damage or, or become toxic. Uh, they, they might even have uh, sustainable uh, products. So always be thinking about environmental concerns when you're developing your product or service to see if they apply to you. The needs of the lawn care business are existing needs. They're not bolded. I'm not doing anything with anybody who doesn't, isn't reliable, low cost, affordable, and experienced. That's a, that's a deal breaker. I won't even get into a new and improved status with them if I don't satisfy those fundamental requirements. Usage of lawn care. Here's environmental concern again. I am concerned about what's inside my home to make sure it's environmentally sensitive to what I'm doing. I'm doing, I, I've, uh, I've ex explored solar paneling uh, because I, I, I believe that less oil and more sun power is a good thing. So remember that environmental concern. People who have a home-based technology uh, skew, they've got uh, Alexa or, I hate that woman. Uh, in any case, um, their, their home-based technology, they're inclined to understand that your that you're landscaping and technology, if it's correctly applied, that's gonna be important to them. They're already there. They're already technology oriented. You've got technology technological advances to your product. Boom, you might have a, a new improved business going on here. People who wanna be the first in their neighborhood, the first on their block, the first in their business, there's always that person. 
triers. And, and they're the ones that want to have the bragging rights of being the first one to have done something. In marketing, it's incredibly important to find out who those folks are because they're going to be anxious to satisfy their trendsetter status. And they're going to give you a shot just because it allows them to say they're the first. So you never want to, as a marketer, ignore, does this apply to you? All right, Jeremy, I can breathe a little more easily now. We can continue. <laughs> um, where are we? Are you sure we already did this with the two forms of market research, marketing research? Give me the next one because I need to turn this over to, the, uh, to Paula and you. Hey, here's a slide to give you some hypothetical questions your research program needs to address so that you can get facts evidence, statistics even, to, to now make your good judgment even better so that your communications reflect better judgment. So what are the absolute strengths of your company? Those may change. What are the relative strengths against competition? Primary competition, what are their strengths that you need to figure out can you, can you compete against? What does your target audience wish that they, that they had with your business? There, we just went into the uh, lawn care thing. Communication feedback, um, does your USP effectively work on the internet or do you need Jeremy's help or somebody like him to get your search engine optimization made to be better and more effective? Uh, media usage, are you using the right channels to reach those customers, especially those customers where their usage behavior can be intercepted? That's a real good for you if you can get that. Prospective customers, I'm deferring to Jeremy's uh, skill on that one. He's gonna cover prospective characters, uh, prospective customers a little better uh, when he sees you next week, might even preview it a little bit. Is your media uh, going to be one that helps give you feedback to your customers? Do they walk through your website? Do they stay? And so there's ways to figure out what is it about your communications that stops the customer? Next, next slide, Jeremy. So we've just done it. We've done something. We've gone through an incredible amount of information in a reasonably short period of time. So what are we doing here? Uh, we've, we've understood the essence of how to develop tools or how to understand tools for effective customer profiling critical need that I hope I'm teasing you with, but you'll become very confirmed that you wanna do that. Uh, I gave you an overview on how to conduct some uh, ideas on how to develop research. This whole thing here in the center of the slide is, I, I, if you're not a member of SCORE, this is an overview presentation. That's, I would, uh, without making too much fun of it, I think this is kind of like the shallow end of the pool. You want to get into the deeper end of the pool where the real information can be presented and also in, you can learn how to better apply it and use it. Join SCORE. Join your local SCORE chapter. Find a mentor. And, and rock and roll. And, and uh, if you're already a member of SCORE, make sure that the mentor that you, you've got understands where your keynotes are on this presentation so you can get them to, to work with you on that. Um, those are my notes. These are my slides. This is it. Uh, I think, Paula, I Thank hope you, everybody. Jeff. Okay, I'll do Fantastic my best to answer any questions. Well, we're trying. We so appreciate you and, and the expertise that you bring. And uh, for those of you who don't know about the SCORE process, when you sign up with SCORE and you get a mentor, Jack and Jeremy are experts that can be brought in to help you with specific issues. So it's really a wonderful opportunity. And we're gonna bring Jeremy in here in just a second. Um, I wanted to first and foremost, uh, we do have a poll here, if you wouldn't mind responding to the poll. It's always great for us to know who you are um, and what audience we bring into mm. the, the fold here. So you'll see come up on your screen a poll and you can look and do that next. And I'll give you a few minutes there to do that. And then while the poll is going on, Jack, we had a couple of questions that I'll field out to you. Um, so you you can, uh, Carol had asked, can you join SCORE as a group? And, you know, and, and that's, um, that's something that, I know Jack, do you wanna field that question? 
Or do you want me the to simple, respond? The simplest thing I can tell you is I had a client uh, that there were four of them. They were all partners of a brand new business that they wanted to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. And, and uh, so absolutely, yes, you can join as a group. I would assume, Paula, that we're talking about a group as defined as partners or very people who are intimately and committed to the success of whatever mm -hmm. the business is. I don't, for independent businesses, I would suggest they go their own route. Okay, and then I'm not sure what this particular question was, but it said, um, it, he just said an at sign that is in the URL. I think that's all in the slide presentation that you have there. And everyone will be getting a copy of that slide presentation. So if they miss something, if you didn't take notes quickly enough, this presentation will be provided to you following the session. So you'll have an opportunity to go through that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then finally, can a mentee from another state tap into the marketing expertise from Minnesota score rep? Absolutely, you can do that. Um, and you can sign up with any score that you would like. Um, and this person says, I have been assigned, I have been assigned a mentor and haven't met them yet. Can you request more or different help if needed? And the answer to that, Susan, is absolutely you can. Yeah, let me inject on that, Paula, real quick. The person who is asking for a mentor, it's real important if you put some information in there about the business you're involved in developing, what kind of category it is, it's going to help the person that is receiving that request better understand who's best to be paired up with you. Okay, great. And then Jeremy, we'll kick it off to you for uh, an intro to the next session, and then um, we'll close the session. Alrighty, thank you very much, Jack and Paula. Um, so next week, we're going to be talking about digital marketing channels, you know, what are all the different channels that you can use to actually start engaging with your customers. Uh, right, so it's everything to do after you've identified your ideal customer. And in these last 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm just kind of going to walk through the process through Facebook, which is going to be one of those channels, um, and show you how to directly engage with uh, your identified customers. Now, what Jack just went through uh, was the process, the fundamental process of creating what's called a customer avatar or a buyer persona, All right? There are two names that mean the same thing. And essentially that's the ideal person that you're trying to sell to, okay? Now, a majority of the time, a business owner focuses so heavily on what they're trying to sell that they forget to focus on who they're trying to sell to. Um, now, a really fun worksheet to fill out is some looks like this. And what you're going to do is you're going to take everything that you just learned from Jack and you're going to put it into this buyer persona worksheet. And you're essentially creating a character sheet. You're creating uh, a human that is your ideal uh, customer. Right. So you can have some fun with it, too. But, you know, ideally, you're going to have all of the demographics information in here. You know, how old are they? What is their gender? Where do they live? Uh, what do they do for a living? How much money do they make? What's their education level? Um, and so you get to put these together. And what you want to do is you want to create a custom, uh, a customer avatar or a buyer persona uh, for each different type of customer. So even though, like, again, like with landscaping or lawn services, um, you could be providing the exact same service, but maybe, you know, on one side, you're trying to market to the new homeowners, you know, 25, 30, 35 years old, or you can also uh, market to your retired people. So 60, 65, 70 years old. Now, even though those two people may be identical with the only difference being their age group, the way that you're going to market to those two different uh, people are going to be a little bit different. So you don't want to have a huge discrepancy. So uh, like I'm trying to market to a, a customer avatar between the ages of 25 to 75, because like I said, the way that you're going to market to those two different types of people are going to be completely different. You know, so one, you could say, hey, you know, you're a new homeowner, you're busy, you're working all the time, you don't have you don't have the time to properly take care of your lawn, let us do it for you. Versus someone who's retired, hey, you know, you can't move around like you used to. Hire somebody to take care of your lawn so it doesn't get out of whack. Um, so even, like I said, even though you're trying to market the exact same service, the way that you're going to do it is different for each one of your customer avatars. So now if we actually dive into Facebook just a little bit, uh, I'm going to show you how to implement that so you can target all of your avatars. 
right? And then th again, this is where we get to hone in on those customer avatars. And the more detailed that your avatar is, the easier and more successful your marketing campaign will be. Um, now, inside of Facebook, you get to create what's called an audience. And what I like to do is create one audience per customer avatar. Uh, and what this allows us to do is if you try to run an advertising campaign, um, you can duplicate that ad campaign um, and target all of your different avatars with the exact same ad. What that allows you to do is you can gather analytical data um, around that to see you know, which avatar is responding the best to a specific ad. And if they're responding really good, you know, that's great. If they're not responding uh, to that particular ad very well, that, that means that you need to tweak your ad for that specific avatar, that specific audience. Um, so when you're boosting a post or when you're creating an advertisement, this uh, is what you're going to see. This is your audience. This is where you get to edit your audience. And the first thing that we're going to look at is putting in the demographics. Okay. So again, this is things like your location, age, gender, uh, what languages they speak, what's their relationship status, education level, are they parents, you know, uh, how old are their children, things like that. So the top box here, uh, first we're gonna look at location. Now we can change this location to wherever your service area is um, or wherever the people are that are going to buy your product. The next thing we're gonna look at is the age. And again, we're creating an audience for every single avatar that we create. So you could have you know, 50 audiences um, you know, or you can have just a couple. Um, so again, we're looking at men ages 30 to 40 inside of the Sarasota area. Because again, this is a fictional uh, landscaping company that services the Sarasota area. And now what we want to do is we want to dive a little bit deeper into our demographics, right? So we're going to click on that browse button on the, on the bottom right there. And that allows us to open up more advanced demographics. So we can get into the education level, their financial situation, how much money do they make every year, uh, life events, they have a birthday coming up. Are they friends with somebody who's got a birthday coming up? Maybe you can, you know, target people with the birthdays and give coupons, you know, oh, happy birthday, get 10% off, uh, you know, landscaping or something like that. Um, you know, are they parents? Do they have children? Are they married? Uh, what do they do for a living? Right. And then in the example on the right, on the bottom right here, what I did was I pulled down the education level. So you can actually, you know, target very specifically uh, how much education they have. Now, as far as a landscaping company may go, uh, you're not too worried about what their education level is. You may be a little bit more worried about their financial situation. You know, you don't want to advertise to people who can't afford your services. Right. So that may be a little bit more important to focus on. And then once we get all the demographics set, we want to get into the psychographics. Again, this is what the, the avatar's interests are and how do they behave. Okay, So these are going to be the, the second two options that we're going to look at. And the first one we're going to dive into is just the interest. You know, what type of industries or businesses do they like? You know, what forms of entertainment do they like? Do they like music, games, movies? Uh, what are their hobbies? Now, with... Uh, with uh, Facebook, you can no longer directly target homeowners. So the way that we get to target homeowners is through the psychographics portion. We have to go through their interests. Okay. So uh, an example for this, you know, because we are a lawn care landscaping company, we want to try and find people who have an interest in things like home improvement, because I can't tell you, you know, it, the only people who are interested in home improvement are people who own homes. So that right there is a way for us to target a demographic through the psychographics inside of Facebook. So it gets a little bit tricky, um, but you know it's it's such a powerful tool to use to really hone in on your target audience. Uh, so for here, I just selected a DIY gardening and home improvement. And then the next thing that we want to look at are the the, uh, the behaviors of the customer. Now in fa in Facebook really what we're looking at are purchase behaviors uh, or purchase intents, uh, device usage, uh, how often they travel, things like that. So if, if you're trying to sell a consumer good, so let's say, you know, 
uh, you know, the landscaping company, we sell those little uh, solar lights that you can put along your driveway or walkways. They soak in the sun rays during the day and then at night they automatically turn on, right? So we wanna try and sell those to our customers. What we can do is we can actually go down into those purchase behavior, which is the third one from the bottom, and we can target people who actually uh, click on ads on Facebook and end up purchasing things. So we can very specifically target people who are more prone to buy things from a Facebook advertisement. And then uh, wh what we're gonna do from there, once you've got your demographics and your psychographics through your interests and your behaviors, uh, we can do a little bit of fine tuning. Now this is more on the advanced side of things, but I do just wanna quickly go over it. So. The button on the left is the exclude button. And this allows you to exclude certain types of people who don't fit your customer avatar. So for instance, um, you know, I'm gonna bring out my laser pointer here. So they can match all of these things. So they can live in Sarasota, they can be a man within the ages of 30 and 40, they can be interested in home improvement. But uh, what I can do is I can set up an exclude to say, hey, even if they match all of this criteria, if they have a low household income, I don't want to try and market to them because they cannot afford our services. So that's one way that you can use the exclude to put in um, things that you, you know for sure you don't want in a customer, even if they match everything else. And then the narrow audience section allows us to get extremely specific and this is one that i would avoid unless you've got somebody who really knows what they're doing because what this does is it sets up a second set of detailed targeting and what you have to do is when you set up a narrow audience it takes the first set of target uh, of detailed targets and then it says okay if it matches one of these and it matches something from the second set then it'll show to that customer so again, the narrow audience allows you to, uh, to kind of really focus in on a specific type of person. Um, so for instance, you know, they are interested in home improvement and they make a, a certain amount of money, then it'll only show to people who are interested in home improvement that are in, let's say the top 40% or top 30%, right? So it's not gonna show to anybody else. So with this detailed targeting, you're showing to people who are interested in do-it-yourself or they're interested in gardening or they're interested in home improvement. With the narrow audience you're doing, you know, let's say they are interested in home improvement and they only make a certain amount of money. So those are just a couple ways to really fine tune your target audience. Um, but you know, unless you know what you're doing or you've got somebody hired to do it, I would kind of stay away from the narrow audience bit. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about today is just sort of, you know, once you've put in your entire avatar, you get to see what's called an audience overview. Uh, and this kind of tells us how big our potential reach is for that specific avatar. Now, because we are a local company, uh, we're looking at a very specific type of avatar, we're going to get a sort of small potential reach number, which is the top right. Now, you know, 7,600 people doesn't sound like a lot, but then you have to remember that this is only, again, men 30 to 40 who live in Sarasota who are interested in one of those hobbies that we noted before. So we're getting very specific because this is exactly who we want to call us to do landscaping, right? Now we can go in and create another avatar and we can do ages 41 to 50 or 51 to 60. Uh, we can go in and say, okay, well, we also want people who live in Bradenton you know, or people who live in Venice. Um, and so as you start to add in all of your avatars, that 7,600 people then becomes 10,000 people, becomes 20,000 people. And that's why it's important to create multiple avatars for all of the different types of, of ideal customers that you want to serve. Now, next week, what we're gonna be getting into, like I said, is an overview of all of the digital marketing channels. Uh, we're going to go over things like website design. We're gonna go over SEO very, very quickly because we've already gone over that. Uh, we're also going to look at pay-per-click advertising. We're gonna look at social media marketing. Uh, and we're gonna look at email marketing as well and a couple other things. So uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next week again. Uh, all of these slides will be available. This is being recorded, so you will have access to this again. 
um, and it should be available on the website at score or at minnesota.score.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is so amazing, Jeremy. And, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to next week. Uh, one of the question that came in is where is this avatar created? So when you're creating an avatar, uh, that worksheet that I showed a couple uh, slides ago, uh, this is essentially where you're creating that avatar. You're taking everything that Jack had mentioned about the demographics and the psychographics, and you're just writing them down on a piece of paper. Uh, now, a, a worksheet like this just keeps things organized for you, and you can just print a bunch of these out. You can pin them up on a wall, um, and you can kind of look at who all of your different uh, ideal customers are. So this is where it's created is just pen on paper. And then they can dive deeper into specific social media profiles once they get into that next week, right? Right. Okay, fantastic. And uh, this is a really interesting question. Since Sarasota is such a tourist-driven economy, can you recommend resources that will help us create profiles or avatars for potential customers from this community? Yes, so, um... You know, one of the things that Facebook has as well is something called audience insights. Uh, if you Google Facebook audience insights, it should be the first link. It'll take you uh, to a page uh, with a, a blue button on there that says access insights or something like that. And that's okay. where you actually get to play around with uh, your audience here. So this is if we already knew our, our avatar, we already knew you know, who our target demographic is, but if we're trying to research who we should be selling to based on the current, you know, in the Sarasota area being very tourist driven, uh, we can go into what's called Facebook Audience Insights and we can do our research in there. So we can look at sure. you know, people who visit Sarasota but don't live here. Uh, we can look at, you know, things like the age range. So we can see if it is the snowbirds coming down for the winter, uh, or we can see if it's people who live overseas or out of state, they come in for a while. Um, and you can also view people who return frequently to Florida. So, you know, if they come here very often, but they don't live here, uh, there are tools inside of uh, Facebook audience insights that allow you to, to view those tourists. Sure. And I think that's really important, Jeremy, you know, they do the pen to paper component before they start jumping into social media marketing, you know, give that some thought, give that some concentrated effort. And then when they go into this, it becomes a lot easier to build that customer profile. Um, and someone just asked if you're available for hire. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy's always available for hire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, we appreciate your expertise in, in coming on and, and sharing your time with us, Jeremy, for sure. And um, we look forward to having folks on. Now, if you haven't already done so, please jump into the chat, take our survey for today's workshop. Um, we will definitely be back here again next week for the final version, uh, the final part of our four-part series and uh, looking forward to doing that. Uh, one final question here. Does Facebook get their info only from their users? Yes. So Facebook, um, the way that they gather their information is when you create an account on Facebook, okay, uh, if you actually go through and read the terms and conditions, uh, you pretty much sign all your, like your life away to Facebook. They monitor every little thing that you do while you're on their platform. But not only that, if you're signed into Facebook and you're browsing the web, they actually monitor what you're doing on the internet. Um, so things like, you know, what websites you're visiting, what actions you're taking on the website. Now they can't see, like if you're typing in a contact form, they can't see the information that you're putting in there, but they know that you're, you're submitting a form on the website. They know what websites you're visiting and they know how long you're on those websites for. So they, they do track their users while they're on the platform. Uh, and, you know, users, they, they, pre they pretty much just give Facebook all of the information anyway. You know, when you set up your account, you put in your name, you put in your birthday, your email address. And then the next thing that it wants you to do is it force you to kind of choose some interests or some pages that you're interested in. And it's essentially just a big data collection 
uh, process. You know, all of the things that you do throughout the website, you know, if you like a post, if you share a post, if you interact with certain pages, uh, you know, it keeps tabs on everything that you do. And then, like I said, it keeps tabs on, on what you do outside of Facebook if you're logged in. Um, like I said, it, it tracks what websites you go to, it tracks, you know, how long you visit, what actions you take on those sites. So it knows your, your behaviors, it knows what you're doing. It doesn't know the specifics, but, you know, for instance, from a landscaping point of view, if you're trying to, um, you know, if you search for landscaping at Facebook and you're looking at different landscaping websites, then Facebook knows, hey, you might be interested in trying to hire some, some landscapers. So the next thing you know, you're probably going to be seeing ads for landscaping on Facebook. Um, so, but like you were saying, yes, you, you do have to have an account inside of Facebook for them to track all of your information. And they only get that information from their folks that are on their platform. So good, good insight there. Well, we thank everyone for coming. Sorry, we ran over a little bit. We'll see you next week for the effective marketing channels for small businesses. And uh, we look forward to it. Thank you again, Jeremy and Jack for your insight today. And we look forward to seeing everyone again next week. Take care.